Hello, um, good evening. I'm going to continue my talks uh, on ancient history. Uh, this time I'm going to be looking at mothers. Um, I will not be looking at the role of mothers in ancient history, but uh, it's going to focus more on what would involve uh, for women not to fulfill the role of mother in antiquity, in ancient Greece and ancient uh, Rome. Um, so to start, um, I'm going to speak about the story of Polyphonte, the daughter of Thraisa and Hypomos, who refuses Aphrodite and wanders through the mountains as a follower of Artemis, a virgin a god, goddess. It is her rejection of Aphrodite, that is her determination to remain virgin that initiates her troubles, her issues, her problems. Um, Aphrodite inspires within her an insane passion for a bear. Polyphonte's shameful union with the animal, in turn, causes Artemis to drive all the animals of the mountain to chase after her. After having run to her father's house, Polyphonte gives birth to Agrios and Oreos, Oreos, two cannibalistic giants who disregard the gods as well as the rules of human society. Their actions bring on Zeus' displeasure and in order to prevent Hermes from mutilating the sons, Ares turns all three into birds of ill omen. At the center of the story, sexual union with a hairy beast is the punishment that Aphrodite herself inflicts on Polyphonte, the maiden who was guilty of preferring the virginal habits of Artemis to the wedding and who, living in the mountains, left undone the most important ritual that awaited her as a woman which was to be married and to become a mother. Ancient people saw bears as scary beasts. They seemingly looked at these animals as if they were semi-human, perhaps connected to the fact that they were able to be on two legs, um, maybe the hairy was connected also to a uh, man and uh, uh, hair growing on the chest and other parts of the body. So opium reminds us that rage is just the last of many points that in the ancient world invited humans to see in the bear a mirror for themselves. The perception of a physical affinity between humans and bears, as scholars point out, makes the second a beastly double of the first. It seems that Polyphonte's transgressive adherence to absolute chastity was punished by Aphrodite by condemnation to a state that represents the degradation of the normal wedding that she had refused. The angry goddess responds to this rejection with a beastly bridegroom and by making the disdainful maiden succumb to the union with all the, her ardor, an ardor with which, according to Opian, she bears themselves pursue their males. Nothing good happens to maidens who become bears' wives. Moreover, with their almost human shape, Birds remind people about the risks connected with the transformation from youth into adulthood, the dangers people can avoid if they conform to the behavioral rules of their community. 
for polyfonte a beastly wedding is just one step in the process of leaving human society a process that will end with her final metamorphosis into a deadly upside down estrix so young women becoming mothers within the rules of becoming old young women becoming old without fulfilling the role of mother out of society and uh, turning into a uh, evil beasts we can interpret the strix inverted position as a symbol that survives her transformation in her distorted womanhood and motherhood polyfonte indeed is an inverted woman both in the overall story of polyfonte then and again in the specific sign of the upside down strix a nocturnal bird of ill omen other girls would be able to read the symbolic antithesis of their potential futures the midwife witch was a literary convention which passed from the demonologists into other kinds of writing without often influencing perceptions about the actual midwives who delivered one's own children two greek child killing demons named lamia and gelo were derived from near eastern demons such as lamastu and galu in the midst of monsters such as Lamia, Gelo and Mormo, a scholar uh, named Johnston sees a precise pattern. At the base of the child-killing demon, there is always a story of unrealized womanhood and more specifically of failed motherhood. As unfulfilled woman, <clears throat> as unfulfilled women who died before realizing their goal in life, these demons are ghosts of inverted femininity taking revenge on those living people who are the object of their envy, usually successful mothers and their babies. In the Roman tradition, in fact, the Strix enjoys a very special relationship with inversion in general. Her features are a blurry combination of the nocturnal bird of prey and the Malefica who is imagined to take the bird's form. Child-killing demons are associated with birds of prey, and particularly with nocturnal raptors such as the owl, not only in other areas of the Mediterranean basin, but in many other parts of the world as well. So, it is not just random that happens in the ancient world, that connection has, has been made in other cultures, in places which were not influenced by uh, Greek and Roman culture. As in many other cultures, the Greek child killer not only was thought to attack infants and pregnant women, but also to seduce and then destroy young men. The common belief that the doorway is a gathering place for demons also expresses the liminal status of the demonic, for the threshold is neither inside nor outside of the house. It belongs to neither the interior sphere nor that of the outside world. It belongs to the gates, to the doors, in between inside and outside. Now, if we look at the story uh, calendar of June, four animals whose traits the child killer borrows in extant sources are the bird of prey, the horse, the wolf, and the ass. Ancient Greeks not only associated asses with stupidity and stubbornness, as we may know, we, you might know already, but also with excessive lust and extraordinary sexual ability. The Strix was a nocturnal bird of ill omen associated with the bubo and depicted by Ovid as a sort of barn or owl. The features of the Strix alternate between those of the supernatural bird of prey, ever thirsty for children's blood, and those of the human Moliere Malefica, in a word, the witch, who changes herself into the bird. 
the mortality rate for infants in classical antiquity was really high, an estimated 30 to 40 percent in the first year of life alone. In light of such information, it is not entirely surprising that figures like Canidia or the Strix are to be found in Latin literature. A sort of explanation had to be given for this high mortality. We must imagine that the stretches who attack the infant are likewise changed externally, but otherwise retain possession of their faculties. This observation is of great use in uncovering the structure upon which the Proca legend is framed. The stretches attack their victims' inner organs, but their own inner natures remain unchanged. Of it is clear that the goddess' dominion over thresholds and doorways is the primary factor in her ability to ward off the stretches. In many cultures, demons are thought to lurk in liminal places so that the control of such places is of vital importance in averting evil force. Hence why it goddess' dominion over those thresholds and doorways. We might plausibly suggest that the ritual use of pigs and as substitutes described by both the Near Eastern texts and Ovid is not simply a matter of coincidence but rather of historical connection. Perhaps the legend of the infant Proca attacked by stretches are and spared by the substitution of a pig has its roots in Mesopotamian ritual. In the calends of June, we find variation on, variations on the larger theme of driving away dangerous elements from both the physical body and the body politic. The treatment of bacon on June first involves culinary inversion. The rejection of such inversion is intended as a rebuff to hostile spirit. As Ovid explains, the unlucky season initiated in mid-May with the Lemuria is brought to an end with the Vestalia of mid-June. Between the two comes the calends of June, connected with the gloomy aspects of May while anticipating the happier second half of June. So it's a period in between May and June. At the center of the story is the figure of the Strix, who as a demon reveals her utterly perverse nature by attacking children, harming those whom she should instead cherish. Against this hostile inverted creature, Karna stands as protector, setting things right by literally distinguishing inside from out. Her treatment of the thresholds and windows of the, thre of the household undoes the evil of the witches who, in Petronius' words, quod surnum est de orsum faciunt, turn everything upside down. The meal to be eaten on this day underscores the point of the legend. Bacon is eaten as an emphatically normal sort of food, unlike the raw pork given to the stretches. One should also eat some beans, but not throw them, as was done only a few weeks before on the Lemuria, as a way to drive off evil spirits. Evil spirits. But even as the Lemuria was meant to repel the ancestral death from the Domus and the other rituals of May were intended to remove impurities from the city. The story of Karna and the Stretches emphasized the lifting of threat from the youngest and most vulnerable members of the household and the promise of good health for all. So it was a protection for the growing children which were in danger of dying or being killed by the stretch, by the witch. As a conclusion, just to say first that the Roman Strix's ability to practice inversion seems to be one of the motives that work as an ideal bridge between the Strix and the ancient human sorcerer, and indeed between the ancient and the modern witch. In stories spread over different times and places, the Strix in particular and the witch in general are unquestionably 
figures of inversion in as much as they symbolically represent or physically practice an overturning of order and, on, and nature. With their last and for blood, their nocturnal flights, their rapacious incursions among babies' cradles, and also in their special power of putting their writings in the wrong place, which is continue to be represented as those ancient upside down stretches. The midwife witch is a stereotype and that has passed straight from the works of the demonologists into the works of historians, with barely a glancing impact on the lives of real midwives. A female, a female who would kill a child or prevent its birth in the first place ran completely contrary, of course, to the fecund and nurturing mother who was held up as the norm to which all women should aspire, attributing such behavior to demons emphasized its uterine abnormality and thus censored it. The ancient literature of Greece and Rome during the 7th centuries from Boyo to Samonicus presents us a fairly consistent view of the Strix. The bird is clearly mythical. But the physical characteristics with which the, um, the fancy of the ancients invested it were those of a bat and not those of an owl, as so generally supposed. Every attribute ascribed to it, except the generic eggs and feathers, is still sometimes ascribed to the bat belong to the bat, many of them in some special or peculiar way. It is doubtless furthered by the fact that the owl is par excellence the nocturnal bird of evil omen everywhere from Iceland to Madagascar and has been such since the right uh, the night of time. It's an animal of night, but also the bats. Safe in ancient Athens alone. Um, furthermore, it is mainly due to this passage passages that Stretches has become the ornithological appellation of the entire suborder of the owls. It is, not simply, it is not simply that witches exist to do evil and thus are inverses of, of normal human beings, but belong these witches harm children, thus conspicuously displaying their inverted natures as women, which they, nur they nurture children. Misfortune cannot be understood to occur randomly, but rather has a purposeful existence that uh, is guided in large part by witches and demons. It is the particular and variable conditions of an event and not the general and universal conditions that witchcraft explains. Fire is hot, but it is not owing to witchcraft, for that it, it is, is, is its nature. It is a universal quality of fire to burn, but it is not a universal quality of fire to burn you. This may never happen, or once in a lifetime, and then only if you have been the witch, you will be burned. It is an explanation why you burn in witches. The witch provides this answer. It is the witch who causes your particular misfortune. One can easily see why the witch would be a preferable alternative to a chaotic world where misfortunes occur in a random and indiscriminate fashion. As the embodiment of all that is hostile to society, the witch is an, is an expression of anti-structure and so can only be pictured in liminal and reverse imagery. The belief that child-killing demons have their origin in mortal women who fail to bear and nurture children successfully. This is suggesting that it is not enough simply to hold back from the overly inhuman act of killing children if a woman wants to retain membership in the human race, but additionally she must bear and nurture children. The goal in life was to become a mother. Failure or refusal to meet this goal amounted to virtually the same thing as an attack against the most important structure by which humanity organized itself, which was the family, or at least that's what was seen in ancient Greece and Rome. Um, with
these few words I completed my talk. I hope you enjoyed.